to tell you the truth, I, uh, I'm coming from a center that uh, decompression means a lot. Okay, so I think the foundations of decompression are two things, very simple. How much spinal cord is swollen from inside and how much there is pressure from outside. Swelling of the spinal cord from inside is God's work and trauma, et cetera, et cetera. But compression from outside is our job to see how we can manage that. So the first column that you see over there, with all respect to all the decompressive, all the, all the authors of decompression, you see the first uh, curve is uh, from Toronto, and the second is also Staskis that was discussed. It all shows shorter decompression is better. But, 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 but the authors are smart enough not to define what is decompression. So the definition of a spinal cord injury is a contusive compressive phenomenon. Reverse encryption is that if you want to decompress the patient, you have to take care of those two problems, okay? So if you look at the second column, which is the basics of decompression at the shock, you see that there is CSF around the spinal cord, despite the fact that the mid-sagittal diameter of at the center of the injury shows that there is um, swelling of the spinal cord. However, there is CSF around the cord, right? There's CSF around the cord. And when Amanda says that the vascular surgeons, they put the lumbar drain and drain the CSF, they would like to take the pressure off the spinal cord from, out, out from, from the periphery of the spinal cord and therefore bring the intraspinal pressure equal to intraventricular pressure or intracranial pressure. So in the third slide that you are looking at, Amanda, you want to comment on that third slide? The third column? Huh? Okay, there is a lot of pressure from where? There's a lot of pressure. This patient has had a bilateral block facet, taken care of by traction, fused by Greg. Post operative MRI shows persistent pressure on the spinal cord. How? Pressure from inside intrinsic and pressure from outside extrinsic. So this patient has not decompressed, has not been decompressed. But this patient is going to be in the Staskis database, okay? Because none of the patients in this case, 220 patients in the Staskis report, they have had post-operative MRI to prove if they are decompressed or not. What about the, third, the fourth slide, Greg? What, what's the fourth slide, the fourth column? Chronic stenosis. So uh, in the fourth column, the, in, the, the contusion is not much. But what is the difference between the cervical spine on this one and the, and the, and the third column? There is a spinal stenosis. Right? Wide eyed There is a spinal stenosis. So here is what I am going to go to the second slide. So, there is intrinsic pressure, which is called intramedullary lesion length, as a biomarker, the length of the edema. And then there is extrinsic pressure because Greg forgot to decompress this patient and tried to so sell it to me that I have decompressed the patient. 
but still there is intrinsic pressure and there is extrinsic pressure. So in this specific session, I would like to I, I would like to make you think that when you are decompressing a patient, there are two possibilities. The first MR shows there is no intrinsic pressure, there is no extrinsic pressure, that patient is decompressed. There is CSF around the cord, so if you want to record the intraspinal pressure, and if you are, if John, you are going to increase your maps, if you know the intrathecal pressure and subtract that from the, your mean, you see that there is spinal cord perfusion pressure. Then you know what's your spinal. But in the previous, uh, okay. Now in this, Amanda, what is, what is, what is the problem with this one? This. What is the difference between the first MR and the second MR? I would say in the, in the second MRI, you have some more swelling, so you have increased intrinsic pressure from, okay. from the cord. This patient has had corpectomy, and at the same time has had laminectomy. So is this patient decompressed? The answer is yeah, no. I mean, if we look at intrinsic versus extrinsic decompression, well, extrinsically, well, the yes, cord, but the not cord is touching the dura, right? It's like a sausage. Yeah. The intrinsic pressure is not relieved. You have relieved the extrinsic pressure, right? But the intrinsic pressure is the is still the, is there, okay? And that's what Greg did. Expansive duraplasty. And with expansive duraplasty, your intrinsic pressure also disappears. So this is, this is a stas case, because I was one of the authors of the stas case. In a patient, in this paper, in 184 patients, we did post-operative MRI in all the patients that we thought they were decompressed. If you perform ACDF one level or multiple level, the chances are that in 48% of the patients, you are going to decompress the patient if you perform post-operative MRI. If you perform corpectomy, 63%. However, if you add laminectomy to your ACDF, you precipitously increase the chances of decompression. So, the, so laminectomy is sine qua non for decompression. The more your laminectomy, the better chance of decompression. So we have two forces, okay? One is the nature, which is swelling of the spinal cord, intrinsic pressure plus extrinsic pressure. One is our preoperative decision-making of how to be decompress the cord. The more you have laminectomy, the second part is true that you are going to conquer the question of the compression. You will, you will, you will be, you will be, uh, why is this so important? It's because the longer your intramedullary lesion length, intrinsic pressure, the less chance of AIS grade conversion after six months. So you must, is a must, you must make sure that your intrinsic pressure is gone. Now also, if you look at your second force, which was laminectomy, the more the numbers of your laminectomy and the more chances of decompression, the better your chances of Asia Asia AIS grade conversion. Look at that. If the, if the patient is fully decompressed, the chance of AIS grade conversion was 58.9%. If the patient is incompletely decompressed, so is this slide has affected 
this test case results? Has there been, you know, I'm not, I'm not being disrespectful to anybody. I'm disrespectful to myself because we didn't do MRI after a stasca surgery, so we don't know how many of 220 pa uh, patients have been decompressed or not decompressed. Therefore, we don't know if they, there was a confounder over there uh, as this issue of decompression, lack of decompression, and the results that we are looking in the first column of the first slide may be a little funny. So, now this is, the, this is what God, God gave us. It seems to me that the subarachnoid space in the brain is much less conspicuous than the subarachnoid space in, in, the, uh, in the spine. Because we do not know if we decompress the spine by just laminectomy, whether the intrathecal pressure would expand the dura, but it does. In the brain, it's not like that. That brain has had expansive duraplasty, but still you don't see the subarachnoid space. In this one, we are, the patient has had only laminectomy, and you see how much the, 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 the um, intrathecal space has expanded. So this is a paper which is very important. So for those who would like to look at this presentation positively, we looked at, and, and, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm so fortunate that shock trauma allowed me for the past 20 years to have CT and MRI pre-op and post-op. So that is 104 patients. In those 104 patients, we looked at the post-op MRI to see how, much, how many of those 104 patients they had good decompression by laminectomy. And it seems to me that 91% 91, 91 of the 104 patients, 101 patient had complete decompression, 91%. Now, if you look at the, if you, uh, this is one of the papers that was written by Tim uh, Krisikos, uh, one of our residents. Now, we looked at the, we looked at intraoperative ultrasound and the compression of the spinal cord, and we found out that from 51 patients, in 45 patients, there was good decompression of the spinal cord, in, which was confirmed by intraoperative ultrasound. So it means that intraoperative ultrasound is very good if you don't have MRI to give the patient postoperatively. However, in four patients, there was not enough decompression confirmed by postoperative MRI. Intraoperative ultrasound showed there was decompression, but in four patients, there was no decompression on the postoperative MRI. And many of these patients, uh, all these four patients, they had inadequate laminectomy. So if the patient had had adequate laminectomy, probably there was no need for postoperative MRI. Now, um, if you look at this patient who was decompressed, and if you look at the intraoperative uh, ultrasound, complete decompression and complete decompression over here, postoperative MRI. Now look at this patient. The compression is not going to be very cheap. Look at all the number of hours underneath that we have spent on this patient to make sure the patient was decompressed. The patient came in with unilateral log facet, had ACDF, was not decompressed, laminectomy was not decompressed, intraoperative ultrasound, you see that you see that almost 95% of the space is, is occupied by the spinal cord. The patient had expansive duraplasty, and there is complete decompression of the spinal cord. So it is tough. 
if you really want to make sure that your spinal cord is decompressed, it's tough. You have to. Now, why is it so important to have it? Because this is John and Amanda. If you, if you are sure that your spinal cord is decompressed based on intraoperative ultrasound and postoperative MRI, then you can monitor intrathecal pressure as your cord perfusion pressure. And then you can have your mean arterial blood pressure minus your intrathecal pressure. And then you have your several uh, cord perfusion pressure. And that you can, instead of for the past 30 years, we have been trusting the mean arterial blood pressure. But if you compress correctly, then your intrathecal pressure, which is much easier than Papadopoulos, what he does in, uh, in London, to put a, a, a sensor inside the spinal cord. You don't have to. If you, if, you have, if you have decompressed the spinal cord correctly, then you can monitor the, in fact, pretty soon we are going to start doing that, Greg, at shock. Uh, we are going to start monitoring intrathecal pressure. <coughs> I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Wow. Yes. Can I ask one question? Again, fabulous lectures. I just feel so blessed to hear all these great lectures and have these phenomenal minds here. Uh, Chris Hofstadter recently published something on doing myelotomies. So going one step beyond uh, dural releases and doing myelotomies on traumatized uh, rats and felt that this led to recovery. What do you think about that concept and when would we I, consider that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Even in the last patient that 95% of the Sausage was against the dura. When I open the dura, the cord is not that bad. If you apply your, your, your patch, if you apply your, your, your duraplasty, then there is no need to open the spinal cord at all. In the, three, in the, in the four patients that we have done duraplasty, as soon as we open the dura and we apply the patch, PO arachnoid is going to stay intact. I don't think there is any need to open and drain the blood from inside the spinal cord. And realistically, I'm afraid to doing that because if, if the intra-spinal pressure is high at that level, the spinal cord can come out like his toothpaste. Just a couple of technical points. Um, does it matter if you cut the dentate ligaments when you're doing your duroplasty? Again, in the, in the four patients that we have done duroplasty, I see the spinal cord slightly swollen. The posterior rootlets are draping over the spinal cord, but the cord starts moving again. Okay. No. Does it matter what you use for your patch? <laughs> we use the Duraflex or bovine pericardium. Yeah. Anything that is sutureable. Um, Duragen doesn't work. Okay. And uh, Liodura could be used. Um, the, um, What's the name of the, Greg, the name of the uh, neuroalloderm is yeah. not good because it leaks. Okay. It leaks. Uh, from, the, from where the hair the has been holds, previously, yeah. yeah, it leaks. We use uh, also, uh, we use either DuraGuard or DuraFlex. Um, and you can show us that in the lab because you're going to give us a lab shortly. Sure, sure. And, and, and one last question. Finally, on the, on the ultrasound, are you looking for cord pulsatility? to go ahead and confirm yes. that there's, there's good, or is it a Absolutely. color flow ultrasound? Uh, I had a couple of videos, I, could, I didn't show it. Uh, you, you see actually, uh, with the ultrasound, you see the cord is, is bouncing around, is, is just pulsating, yes. Just fantastic, thank you. Thank you, thank you Bijan. Thank you.